Welcome to Candlewick Library. I'm Cheryl, and today I'm sharing my Back to Hogwarts Readathon wrap up. I have had so much fun in September doing this Back to Hogwarts Readathon. Angie and Alma and Lucy and Christy have been so much fun to work with. Last week, if you caught our last live sprints, we did announce that this is going to be an annual thing. I am going to be bringing this back next September. This time I put it together really fast over a few days. I was trying to decide whether to do it or not. I wrote out the prompts, came up with some of the ideas, and then reached out to the co-host, put it together within a few days. And so next year I definitely want to take a little bit more time, make it even more fun. I hope that you guys will all join in again next year. So next September, Back to Hogwarts will be happening again. I did say that I was going to have a few more videos throughout the month that were Harry Potter themed, and I fully planned on doing that. And in fact, Sunday, September 29th, I was going to post my Chamber of Secrets review, but I have not had the time to prepare for it. We had some things happen in our family the last few days that just made it impossible for me to get it done. And so that will be coming sometime soon, probably in October, but I'm not gonna make any promises just because I do have a lot of other things I have to get to. And the other reviews for the other Harry Potter books, even though I will be reading the books this year, trying to finish them by the end of the year, those reviews will be coming throughout the next year. So I will be having a full review like I did for the Sorcerer's Stone, Philosopher's Stone. I will have a video more in-depth review like I did for that for all of the books. I just can't promise for sure when they're gonna be coming. So I decided to have my wrap up post on Monday, September 30th as the final video for September for the Back to Hogwarts readathon rather than having it on Tuesday, which is my normal posting schedule. So I'm gonna get to the books that I read for the readathon. Since I was the one that created the readathon and had made the prompts, I decided that I really needed to try to get all of them. I'm gonna go through each of the prompts and what book I read for them. And then I have a, a few last things I wanna say about the readathon. So for the first book, for Philosopher's Stone, that was The Found Family or The Boarding School. And for that, I read First Term at Mallory Towers by Enid Blyton. This was the first book that I remember ever reading by Enid Blyton. And at first I just wasn't sure what I was going to think of it. The whole time I was thinking this is a very simplistic book and kind of childish. The kids could be a little bit mean, especially a couple of them. There's one girl that's really the bully. And when I talked about the boarding school kind of book, I did mention how there was usually, you know, the one bully all the kids dislike. And there definitely is that in this book. But I also felt like one of the characters that is supposed to be one that the other girls are looking up to was kind of mean sometimes as well. And so I wasn't sure if I was going to like it. The whole time I kept thinking I probably won't continue with the series. However, by the time I got to this the end of this book, I really did feel connected to the characters. There were two characters in this that I really liked. They were my favorites of the girls that she was in her dorm with. So throughout the book, I kept wishing that those were the friends that she was trying to get closer with rather than the ones that she was. And so I was very pleased with how this wrapped up. I found myself very connected to the students and to the school. So I think I actually will eventually get to the rest of the Mallory Towers book. I also spoke about how with this kind of book that there usually is that growth throughout the whole series as we watch them mature. And so I am very curious to see if that happens with Daryl, she's the main character, and with some of the other girls and to kind of see where they end up at the end. One of the quotes that I wrote down from the book was when a girl said, you can't possibly do anything if you think you can't, but you can do impossible things sometimes if you think you can. The second prompt was for Chamber of Secrets and the prompt was a secret in the title or the plot. I started out by reading The Secret Door, Badger Hill Farm book one by Jenny Phillips, but I really didn't like it. I would imagine that a lot of children would love this and there might be other adults that do as well, but for me, they felt like fake caricatures of children. I might not have felt that way if I hadn't read it right after Mallory Towers, whereas in that book, I saw these imperfect kids make good and bad choices and I did see growth in them by the end. I felt like these characters are just the same the whole time. There's no real growth with them and they don't really need it because they're already perfect. That's kind of how it felt. It had some good messages in the book. I don't think it was a bad book. I just don't think it was worth my time. And I ended up skimming a lot of it at the end where I was just, I just wanted to get to the end. And so I decided that I wasn't going to count that for the secret. And instead, 
I had recently, I, I believe it was Shannon on Old American Spirit talking about a book by Julie Clausen that she really liked. I went to write it down as a recommendation because it sounded really good and realized it was one of the ones I already had in my TBR cart that I hadn't read yet. The Secrets of Pembroke Park by Julie Clausen. I ended up reading this one instead for the secret prompt and I'm so glad I did because I loved this book. And I am a huge fan of Julie Clausen anyway. I haven't read any books by her yet that I haven't liked. There's been a few that I liked better than others, but I have enjoyed all of them. I thought that this might be my favorite book of the month while I was reading it, but by the time I finished, there were a few things that took it down a couple of points. I felt like it could have been a little shorter. It's a pretty big book, and I felt like the story, there were a couple of times when it lagged a little bit. Not bad enough that I was bored or didn't want to pick it up. It just, there were a few times when I felt like the pacing was a little bit slower. The main concern I had with it is there is a romantic relationship in the book that I felt like it was a little unrealistic for the time period as far as how they acted around each other and a few of the scenes between them. Nowadays, it would have been totally normal, but I felt like it was pretty unrealistic for that time period. And so that was the only real thing that took me away from the story. The main girl is named Abigail, like my oldest daughter, and she and her family are coming into some financial trouble. They end up having to leave their home and they're offered a home from very distant relatives that they get to go live in this manner that nobody has lived in for a while. Then it has some spooky elements and there's murder involved and it's just very interesting. There's a mystery the whole time. I thought that I had the mystery figured out and I did, but that didn't take away from it at the end, even though I'd already figured it out. So I definitely recommend this book. Good from bad, William had once said. God excels at that. Next is Prisoner of Azkaban an animal on the cover. For this, I read another Enid Blyton book. This was another one I picked up when I got Mallory Towers. I also got the first book in the Famous Five because I wanted to try this out as well. Five on a Treasure Island. And this tells the story of three siblings who go to spend the holidays with their aunt and uncle and their cousin, George. George is the girl, I believe it's this one right here. Her dog, Timmy, also makes up one of the five. Just like with Mallory Towers, I was also feeling the same way with this book. I didn't think I was going to really like it. I didn't really like George, their cousin. She wants to be like a boy and she's more moody. So I wasn't sure about her and I just wasn't really caring too much about it at first. But by about halfway through it, it started to really pick up. And I found the interesting thing with this book was that while George was more brown sometimes and the other kids weren't they didn't seem fake either and then there was that lesson in there by the end where she realizes I want to be more like my cousins and so I felt like it had some good lessons there by about the middle you start to get into kind of an exciting story and with treasure and this castle and some bad guys and so by the end of this, I really enjoyed this book as well. And I will probably read more of the Famous Five books too. Number four, Goblet of Fire, was a book with school spirit or a competition. Originally, I was planning on reading pr Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire for this and using the Triwizard Tournament as the competition. But I also had to read Prisoner of Azkaban before I got there. I knew by the time I got to Prisoner of Azkaban that I wasn't going to finish both. But as I'm reading this, there's Quidditch in it. So I decided that still counts. There was still a competition in this book. So for the competition, I read Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, book three. This is my favorite Harry Potter book. I'm going to see by the end of this read, read through if it still is my favorite. I kind of feel like it's tied with Deathly Hallows now, but we'll see. I love the, the new information we get in this story. I love the new characters. I've said before, I love Lupin. Time travel always messes with my mind in a book and this has some time travel in it, but I still loved it. I still think it was done really well. Knowing that I'm gonna be writing the curriculum for my daughter for this, I marked a lot of spots for things I didn't wanna forget when I'm writing the curriculum. And I just had such a fun time reading this throughout this readathon and having at least one Harry Potter book that I was reading during it. And I just, I just love Harry Potter and I just, I just love this book. Number five is Order of the Phoenix and that was A Secret Society or Uprising. For this, I read Uprising by Jennifer Nielsen. I have talked a lot about Jennifer Nielsen on this channel. I've enjoyed her young adult slash middle grade fantasy and that I love her historical fiction. And this was no different. I really enjoyed this book. There were a couple of things that kept this from being a five star, like her historical fiction usually is for me. One, I felt like it took a lot longer to engage in the story than it usually does. The first half of this book, it took 
quite a few days to read the first half. And then the last half I read in one day. So the pacing definitely takes off about halfway through. And the first part is just the build up, the lead up to the action in the book. I don't think there was anything wrong with that. I don't think it was bad that it took me a while to get involved and engaged in it because that's kind of the purpose. You have to kind of get to know and understand what's happening in Warsaw and get to know the characters so that you'll really care about them as you find out what happens to them. But it did feel a little bit more like that than, than her books normally are. Again, not a huge problem, but that was one thing. The main reason is that because unlike her other books, this one was written about a real person. So the other ones have real things that are happening, but then fictional characters put into them. This was written about a real woman when she was a teenager and things that she really did and really went through but it also has a lot of fiction woven into her story and some things that were changed. I didn't realize that when I first got this book. I did realize it right before I started reading it because on the front it says based on a true story one girl will rise up to resist when the Nazis invade her homeland. While I was reading it I did what I always do when I know something is based on a true story but is written in fictional form. I am constantly questioning everything that happens wondering how do they know about this conversation? Did this conversation really happen? Is this person real? Is that person real? Is this situation real? And there was one part that I thought was just one of the coolest things that I've read in a book like this. And I still don't know if it really happened. She doesn't mention it in the afterword. So I'm assuming it did because there is an afterword explaining a little bit more about this girl and telling some of the things that she changed a little bit or, or that didn't happen, but it doesn't go through everything. And so then I'm left by the end of the book wondering how much of it is real. And I don't like that. So that is something about me, I guess. I don't know if I've talked about this before. I don't really like reading fictionalized books about real things. I like it if it's, if it's something that really happened or a person that really existed, I like it when it is nonfiction. And if it is a real story, and even if you want something about a real person in it, I like it if they're not the main character. I like in my historical fiction for the main characters to be made up fictional characters placed into things that really happened so that I can see the things that really happened. I can hear the stories, but not get into the head of someone who can't speak for themselves. I know a lot of people would disagree with me on that, but it, that is something that I don't like. And so I would say that this had the potential of being one of my very favorite Jennifer Nelson books, but just because of that and not knowing for sure what things really happened and what things really didn't, it would be probably one of my least favorite, but I still really enjoyed it. It's still a really good book. It's a really good story. The girl was amazing. And I hope that the one thing that happened in the book really did happen. It had to do with the piano. If this book was just a fictional character and it was the exact same story, it would have still been not quite five stars because of the fact that it took me a lot longer to get into it, but it would have been very close. So I think that if I was going into this, into reading this again, I would just want to pretend like it was completely fictional. I did write down a quote from it. Heroes are those who stand up to do the right thing no matter how their stories end. Number six was Half-Blood Prince, a number on the cover or in the title. For this, I read One Tuesday Morning by Karen Kingsbury. This is the book I picked up at a local used bookstore a couple of months ago. And since it was about September 11th, I wanted to save it for September. So that worked out perfectly for this prompt. Also, what worked out really well was that this book starts on September 2nd, 2001. Each chapter has the date on the top of it. And so I ended up deciding to read each part on the day that it was taking place. And so I read all of those leading up to September 11th, and then I read all of the September 11th chapters on September 11th, and that ended up being very powerful. So I would highly recommend doing that if you read this book, unless you you know don't wanna wait until September, but it was very meaningful. There was one part in here that I had to mark that I was crying, literal tears running down my cheeks. Usually when I say a book makes me cry, it is more of, it makes my eyes you know, fill up with tears. It makes me feel choked up. It's more rare for me to actually have tears running down my cheeks. And this book definitely did that to me. And that was on September 11th. And I think that that added to that, that what I was reading, imagining it happening, even though this is, like I said, like I was referring to a minute ago, these are fictional characters put into a real life situation. And so even though these characters weren't real, I was thinking about all of the people that were in situations like that during the time I was reading it. And it was so good. I, I really, really loved it. This also 
could have been a perfect book for me, but I did have one problem with it. And that is that there are two men, even though the part that made me weep was one of the most powerful things I've read, I wished it didn't happen. And I was not completely happy or satisfied with the ending. And I would love to say why, but it would spoil it for anybody who's, who want, wants to read this. It's hard to critique somebody who is a good writer and say, oh, I would have done that better or something. You know, there's usually a reason for things and I'm sure she had her reason for ending it the way she did. But occasionally you can say to somebody that isn't gonna read it, hey, this is how it ended and this is how I would have ended it. And they say, yeah, that would have been way better. And that is what happened when I was explaining it to the person I knew wasn't going to read it. I loved this book. I highly recommend it, but I would love to chat with somebody who has actually read it to see if you agree with me on that. I still think it's very worth the read. It was only the second book I read by Karen Kingsbury, and it's the second one that has made me cry like that. So I think she is definitely one of those writers that can get me very emotionally involved. Number seven is Deathly Hallows, and this was a book with a quest or a journey. For this, I read The Luminous Life of Lucy Landry by Anna Rose Johnson. This was another disappointment for me. I thought that I was going to love this book. I love the cover. I think the cover is beautiful. Having it be a Native American girl going to live with this family at this lighthouse, so it's kind of a found family situation. She's very imaginative. It said something about a necklace that her dad had looked for and she's gonna try to find this treasure. And so I thought it was gonna be really exciting, very interesting, and I just thought it would be really heartwarming and that I was going to love it. It sounded like the perfect book and something that I hadn't read. I felt like she was trying to make Lucy Landry into another Anne Shirley, but Lucy wasn't as endearing as Anne is. And so I never really liked her that much. I didn't hate her, I, but I never, I never came to really care about Lucy. The so-called mystery was very anticlimactic. I didn't feel like that was anything like what I expected it to be. And I felt like her being indigenous also was kind of pointless because it hardly came into the story at all. And I felt like that there was a lot that could have been done with that as well. I felt like it could have been a really strong story, but that there were too many things that I didn't enjoy. And there was something at the end that kind of bothered me. And there was a Goodreads review that I read where somebody mentioned the same thing. And that is a certain something that a lot of children believe in and it ruined that. So I felt like that was kind of a bad move for a children's book that younger children might be reading. So anyway, this book ended up being a disappointment, but that happens. And then there was The Cursed Child Square to watch an adaptation or play a game. I am going to still be playing a game with my daughter for school as well. We were gonna do it on Friday, but we're gonna have to do it on the very last day of the month. I also was able to count the Harry Potter trivia that we played on our live sprints last week. That was really fun except that I completely embarrassed myself because I missed at least two questions that I knew the answer to and one of them was easy. And so I was, <laughs> I was so mad at myself. Um, but yeah, but it was really fun. And uh, thanks again, Lucy, for doing that. That was, that was so much fun. And so anyone who watched those sprints can count that on their bingo board as well. So the last square was the center HP square where you were supposed to read something that had H and P in the title or had magic in it. This is what I was originally planning to read Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban for. I was able to move that to the other prompt because Lucy from the Lucy Chronicles reached out to me and asked if I wanted to buddy read Wistress by Nadine Brandes during the readathon. And I, ha I did have this on my car as a maybe for September. And so I thought, sure, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna read it with her. I hadn't done a buddy read on YouTube yet. And so we read this together. It started out interesting to me and I thought that I might like it. I was kind of confused by the magic in it especially for one particular character. I didn't understand how it worked. I felt the same way I did in Fox by her, where I felt like she didn't, that she explained the magic, but not in a way that really made sense to me. However, other people love both of them. It is clearer to them than it was to me, but I was a little bit confused by that. Also, just like in Fox, the magic seemed to have kind of a voice. Just like in that book, it made me a little uncomfortable. And Lucy kept saying that she felt like the writing was just off a little bit and I, and I think that that might be part of it that what I'm feeling that makes me feel that way about the voice. I really liked Romanoff 
by her. And that was the first book I read from her. And then I read Fox and now I've read this and two out of the three I have not liked very much. I liked Fox better than this one. I think it was a more interesting story. I just don't like her writing style, I guess I should say. So I don't think she's bad. I don't think the books are bad. I just don't think that they're a good fit for me. I don't like her writing style personally for me, except for Romanoff. I really liked Romanoff. One thing I would also say about her is I would say that there is a lot more violence in her books than I would expect from a Christian book. And I don't know why I feel that way, but maybe I just think that there's going to be less. And all three of the books have been pretty violent, and I felt like this one was the worst. Romanoff did have a part that was a little bit more gory, maybe, in the violence than I would have liked, but then I felt like this one was way worse. There was one scene that got to me, and I didn't like it, and I wanted to put the book down and not finish it at that point. But I did. I stick. I stuck with it. I finished it. I did not like the ending, so I probably won't be reading any more books by her. With those books, I was able to mark off all of the spots on my bingo board and finish out the readathon the way I wanted to. And then I read one more book in September that was not for the readathon. This was for the Inklings that I do with my mom, and that was Once Upon a Prince by Rachel Houck. This was a Hallmark movie that my mom really loves, and so she picked this book for us to read together. And I went into it kind of thinking it might be cheesy. I think I've seen the movie before, but I don't remember anything about it. But I actually really loved this. The kind of royal trope, I felt like this did it so well. You know, with this kind of book, you usually go into it kind of knowing what's going to happen at the end. And yet, there were things I thought were going to happen that didn't. And so it was predictable and unpredictable at the same time. There was some really great faith content in it. Contemporary romance books I are, are not my most read genre and I really loved it. This actually ended up being my favorite book of the month. I did write down one quote from it where the main character is saying, Lord, here we are. We don't know what's ahead, but you do. Whatever it is, we'll love it because you love us and you are good. On top of that, I did have two books that I decided to put down. One was a book called Prepare to Thrive. It was a book that was written for teenagers that are gonna go off to college and how to kind of handle a secular college for a Christian kid. That actually was really good. The only reason I DNF'd it is because I was reading it aloud with my daughters and they just felt like it wasn't information that they needed right now. And so if either one of them decide to go off to college somewhere where they feel like they need it, then they will revisit it. We just felt like we were wasting school time on something we didn't need right now. I talked a couple of months ago about a book I was reading about the Mountain Meadow Massacre, which is another really hard, horrible story in Mormon history. And I started reading a book about that and I was going to do a deep dive video on that. That also happened on September 11th. And so I was gonna try to get that up by then. But I was having a really hard time getting into that book. I, I wasn't enjoying it as much. I didn't really like the way it was written. And so I, was having a hard time wanting to pick it up. So I will revisit that later. I don't know when, but probably sometime next year, I'm gonna pick that book up again when I don't have as many books I'm trying to read and see if it will make an interesting video or not. If not, I will just do it in a normal review video. So those were my only two DNFs of the month. And then we read two plays in school. We read Much Ado About Nothing and As You Like It. And those were really great. I really enjoy reading those with my girls. We didn't read them in the original Shakespeare text this time. We read them from Charles and Mary Lamb's book. Those are really fun, really well done. So I read 10 books and DNF'd two and then two plays. And out of all of those, there were only three that I didn't really like. And as far as my other challenges of the year, for the Read Your Bookshelf Challenge for September, the mod side was Kill Many of the Orchard. Music is a major part of the story or historical fiction. And so I used Uprising for that because there was music in Uprising as part of the story, and it was also a historical fiction. And then for the Doyle side, it was The Adventure of the Dancing Man involves puzzles or codes or a mystery. And so I used The Secret of Pembroke Park for that. I didn't read any Sherlock books in September. For the Read Around the World a Thon, the September prompt was a souvenir on the cover that you would buy. And I used Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban for that because Harry is holding a wand on the cover of my edition. And I have bought a wand as a souvenir. Buzzwordathon had senses and I used Luminous Life for that loosely just because I thought Luminous kind of makes me feel like senses of something you see that's lit up. And then like I said, Once Upon a Prince was for my Inklings group for, with my mom. Well, I think September was a pretty good reading month. I'm really looking forward to October. And then like I said, Once Upon a Prince was my favorite read of the month. However, that's only because I only count new reads. Technically, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban was my favorite book of the month. But since that's a reread, I don't usually count rereads as my favorite unless I don't read anything else that's good. So the one last thing I wanted to say on here is again, thank you for 
participating in the Back to Hogwarts readathon. And I hope that you'll be looking forward to it next year. And maybe some of you that have didn't take part maybe will next year. But also I wanted to remind you that if you have got all nine squares without doing any doubling up, please reach out to me to let me know. I know that some people have posted things on Instagram in their stories or in their feed. And I've tried to share a lot of those on Instagram. But sometimes I will lose track of who has done what. So if you are on Instagram, please message me on there and message me the picture of your little bingo card or the list of what you've read for each one and what game you've played or adaptation you've watched so that I can enter you in the drawing. And this also goes for my co-host. Anyone who has managed to do all nine separate things, please message me on Instagram. Or if you if you don't have Instagram, leave me a comment on this video letting me know that you have finished or do both just to make sure I get it. I'm gonna leave the giveaway open through this week. So it will be up until October 4th. If there are any entrants, I will be putting them into a little cauldron I have and then I will videotape me pulling one out to be the winner of a book. So please reach out and let me know so that I can make sure that if you have done this, that you are in the giveaway. And again, thank you for participating. I hope that many of you will join us again next year.